Hey folks, it's Greg and Jan with Strange RV Tours. Today we are in Kilgore, Texas at the Texas Broadcast Museum. Now, this is how they got that uh, film on air. This is a slide projector and a film projector. Well, they would go into this uh, mirrors and prisms and then this is a camera at the back. Wow. So that, that's, you know, and these are actually just uh, 35 millimeter slides. Oh. Uh, you know, rotating drum. Of course that had, you know, please stand by, you know, back in 10 minutes or whatever. Right. These film will break. I don't know if you remember seeing them burn yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But you see them melt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. And how, like, back back in the day, you know, you'd have an electric cam in the studio mm -hmm. to do your show with. Well, the way they got a copy of that was they'd have a studio monitor with a film camera aimed at it. And so the quality was abysmal. Yeah. Well, Jackie Gleason came up with the idea to use a film camera and electronic camera, use the same lens where you got them both at the same time. Okay. Well, they still filmed the monitor so they'd know where to make their splices and get them accurate. Okay. But back in the day, like Jackie Gleason would do his show on Saturday night in, in New York, mm -hmm. and then they'd do their film trickery, we'll send it out on bus to the affiliates for the next Saturday night. Oh, okay. And so everything was a week delayed, so unless you were wherever the film, the show right. was produced. And then came this monster. This thing is first generation videotape machine. Starts there. Ends oh here. goodness. Oh my gosh. It's about 2,000 pounds. And it came out in the late 50s. This, this without this bridge was about $45,000, $50,000. And with all of this accruement, it was about $60,000 here in the day. But the accountants loved it because this is a one hour videotape. <laughs> here, here, let me see. Whoa. Well, it, it was that same $200 as the film that you could tape over this 40 or 50 times. That's amazing. But, you know, there's a downside to that. We lost everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, you couldn't save anything. You know, when, yeah. when Johnny Carson first started, I think it was his first four years, they had a tape for Monday, one for Tuesday, so on, so on. So last week's show got wiped out while they taped next week's. Well, Johnny, he had a re-up on his contract. He got it written in where he could make a tape of it, and that became his possession. Well, he spent $50,000 on this generation tape machine. Of course, he had to buy the machine, the $200 for the tape, and a tape operator. But oh, still, okay. it, you know, it made him a very wealthy man, yeah. as though he wasn't before. Now, but, but this is second generation. And what year was this approximately? Uh, it was in the 60s sometime. Okay. Uh, Chuck, the museum owner, says that he used one of these when he first got into television back in the 60s. Okay. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, you, it shows how you lift it. Mm -hmm. And now we can edit on our phones. Yeah. <laughs> and he, you know, he was also says, you know, how much more convenient it was to be able to load it like that instead of having to reach over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Of course, this was an optional unit here. This this made it color. Mm. Okay. So, you know, that was like a fifteen thousand dollar option to get get color. Oh, that's pretty cool. These cameras behind you here are all Marconi, made in England. Okay. And one of the local affiliates in Dallas, WFAA, had these cameras like this in their mobile unit, and this, this camera was part of their mo mobile unit. And we don't know for sure if that camera is this camera, but mm -hmm. they're virtually the same. But that is Kennedy's hearse on its way from Parkland Hospital to oh, the airport. Oh, wow. Wow. And this is kind of a, an infamous camera. It is... Right there. Okay. And that says they were bringing Lee Harvey out of the, down to the police base when I think they were taking him to be arraigned mm -hmm. when Jack Ruby stepped up and, and shot him. And 
the Sixth Floor Museum authenticated this camera, mostly because it was known to be camera number four. Okay. And they knew that that was camera number four in there. This is a first generation color television set. <laughs> first generation color TV camera. In fact, this is serial number 40. And there are only about 4,000 of those TV sets made. I think the manufacturer bought most of those back because their quality was so busy. Really? <laughs> and these cameras, you know, you not only had your camera operator, but you had a cable puller because there were three of these cables went to this camera. Whoa. And then on top of that, you had an engineer sitting at this board making sure everything was uh, not rolling and fuzzy and colors balanced and all that sort of thing. We've got another rack of electronics about this tall down to our other building that goes with this. Wow. But from here up, you see the guys carrying that in a football stadium. Mm -hmm. From here up, this thing weighs about 350 pounds. Oh, goodness. So, you know, notice how easily it moves on that dolly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, you can barely touch it and it moves. Oh, yeah. Dick Clark started in Philadelphia and was in black and white. Mm -hmm. Well, when he moved to Los Angeles and went color, he used that camera. It was part of the array that went with him. American Bandstand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Y'all remember Lawrence Well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You like me, had to sit sit in the living room and watch it while your parents mm -hmm. enjoyed it. We got to watch it. They enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. My grandmother actually played piano oh. with him oh. when he was, like, messing around and practicing. Well, this and is uh, the first champagne lady. She was from here in Kilgore, Texas. Yeah. And this, this camera was used on his show. Yeah. And, and the, the champagne lady, she has the distinction, as far as we can tell, being the first person fired on live television. Yeah. 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 Was, it's because she, her skirt was, like, too short. Yeah, she was sitting on a, uh, a desk when they panned back, and you could see her knee. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Lawrence came back after the, the hard commercial break and said, Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a family show. We won't be having such as that. She will not be returning next year. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty nuts. Nice. This box here, channel selector on our volume control, goes with this too. Oh, okay. It's got okay. this umbilical to, oh. to connect the two. So you can kind of more or less have remote control of television. Huh. <laughs> the, these are the, the, called Predicta all by Philco. Okay. And, you know, they were manufactured in the uh, last couple of years of the 50s and maybe 1960. And their, their commercial tagline was, now TV viewing will be just like you're in 1965. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Jetsons. Yeah. They be controls right beside your chair. Style. Now you can put the picture. I've never seen one of these in real life. Move it as far mm -hmm. away as 25 feet, well, even to another room. There it There's is. never been anything like it. But these See things, the again, the quality was so this week, abysmal. At your I think it has eventually put Philco out of business. Philco bought Philco out. Philco okay. okay. used to die on over everything and was always having cash flow problems. But, you know, back then, everybody had a TV guide. Well, where did your TV guide go? On top of your TV. Right. Those cooling holes, you know, you put your TV guide there, and then the smoke comes out here. Battery powered television set. And that commercial That's right, is for these televisions. Anywhere, the first four. Okay. Like a portable radio. Wow. Take out to the beach. Mm -hmm. or indoors, Do, do those have tubes in them and stuff too? Oh, these are solid state. Are they? Like early, early solid, uh, solid state TV. They had a, a battery in them that cost $5.50. It, it was rechargeable, mm -hmm. but you'd probably you probably still need two of them if you're going to watch the entire program. Train. Wow. <laughs> Remember the good old days when you could go down to 7 Eleven if you were brave enough to take the tubes out of your TV and go down and plug them in and see if they were any good? Yeah, I remember those days. I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't, luckily. Yeah, but I remember. I would have never been able to get them back in the right place if I were brave enough to take, you know. And if I took mm -hmm. one out, I'd never be able to get it clocked. Right. <laughs> the way it's supposed to go back in. Wow. Yeah. How about the movie Giant? Did you see? 
Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah like, definitely. Well, they uh, shot all the exterior mm -hmm. in Marfa, Texas. Mm -hmm. and there was, uh, as I understand it, they rented Elizabeth Taylor Rock Hudson houses by uh, James Dean and, and uh, Dennis Hopper mm -hmm. and all the rest of the talent had to stay at, and crew had to stay at uh, the one hotel in town. Men didn't have telephones in the room. Oh, okay. but, but they had this telephone box in the lobby. Oh, okay. So if James Dean or Dennis Hopper or any of the rest of them the office of the a phone Commissioner call, it would have been in that phone box. Really? Mm -hmm. Now we've looked. We can't find any initial scratches. Well, I'm looking. Right? I'm looking. <laughs> <Is there any? laughs> That's a, I, unfortunately, that's a different telephone. But it's, now, from what I understand, some of the movie set is still out there. I think so. Mm -hmm. you know. mm, see, I'm touching the same place he touched. There you go. <laughs> yeah, James Dean had to have been taking notes. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I see. This is a mock up of a 1960s radio station. Okay. Turn the Would you Mr. Gar, here I am chicken man down. But they, they came up with these, look like an eight track tape player. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, these are the cartridges, and this is, these are where the eight track derived from. Okay. The, these are cartridges, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, for uh, radio spots, ads, mm -hmm. jingles, station ID, that sort of thing. That way, you know, the, the DJ would play them. They'd automatically rewind, ready for the next time they could play. Like it says, do not put pennies on the toner. How many times have you done that? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Everybody's done that on a turntable. It's so funny. You know, don't take any requests until 7 p.m. This, this is very typical. I remember these same kind of notes at the, the uh, college radio station in Odessa. You know, wow. you know they got the, the sticker board, you know, what you can play when and you know, that, where you had to have your breaks and all that sort of thing. I had no idea. Wow. Jackson Brown. There you go. This soundboard was actually built for James Taylor by Shoko in Dallas. Shoko was the second largest concert audio oh. production company in the world. Okay. And this was hand built. It's number one. This is the first modern soundboard. Uh, wow. The guy that actually built it will pop up on that screen in a second. But it's all hand assembled and designed and everything. It was about to go in a dumpster. Really? And yeah. he had the presence of mind to save it. And he offered it to the Rock and Roll Museum Hall of, Hall of Fame, but they didn't want it for whatever reason, so we got it. He brought it here in its road case that it had been in for 20 years. We took it out, put it on the table, plugged it in, and it worked. Wow. Aww. Well, part of this thing's history is running on empty live album mm -hmm. it was recorded through that board. Wow. Paul McCartney and Wings live album, Wings Over America, recorded through that board. Willie Nelson recorded on it, and many, many others as well. That's actually the gentleman that built the frame. Sitting at it. So that is the man that built the soundboard. Okay, there's Paul McCartney sitting, sit, sitting at the sound. Yeah. So, you know, this thing, that soundboard's a piece of history. Oh, no, yeah. The museum. This is pretty cool. It this is. is massive. Yeah. This is a, a waveform monitor. Okay. Oh, I see myself. Yeah, and what, yeah, what that does is that kind of <laughs> interprets the wave that... Uh, Where is it? Right there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Interprets the wave that comes from the transmitter essentially to your antenna and then your TV interprets that way. <laughs> the, the green screen works and there's a monitor. Oh yeah. Well, the, You're a weather a girl. Facing the green screen so you can tell. Oh yeah. Well you can come over here and Oh, then you can place yeah, the weather girl? The weather. Yeah. Okay. All right, you're in the picture, so you need to move. Okay. Okay. Guys, <laughs> okay. yeah, going down to Florida with the hurricane. <laughs> if you see the monitor over there, or can you see it over oh, there? Oh, yeah. 
we can go all the way up to Bangor, Maine, where I was born. And here's our forecast for the week. Tuesday with... <laughs> I make a good... You, you have to be a fast weather person. Yeah, yeah. You have to be the cloak of invisibility. Ready? Wow. <laughs> she just proves the kids love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this fun. is the news set for, for Channel 51 out of Longview. They later moved to Tyler. Yeah, see, I can go yeah, up this, and be on all the, the too. monitors and all the black squares yeah. and all that stuff works. Not fun for We've got amazing. a teleprompter, but nothing that's just yeah. kind of frozen on that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty neat to see what they see when they're mm -hmm. doing a broadcast. Yeah, they... 78, 79, and 74 for the next few days. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the late 70s when I was in college, you Central Texas, you were messing with the FM dial trying to get KLBJ. They were the progressive radio station in the state of Texas. Okay. That's the board we were listening to. Oh, wow. Used in about 1975 at KLBJ. Interesting thing about LBJ is their general manager was one of Lyndon and Lady Bird's son in laws. Well, when it came time for a divorce, he was able to go to court and prove that he built the station. Oh. oh. And he got it in the settlement. Oh. Which that's saying something that you could beat Lyndon and Lady Bird yeah. in a yeah. Travis County court. Yeah, true. But they had the, the Austin American States in the newspaper. I know at least one TV station, I think two, and more radio stations than the FCC would allow. But somehow or other, they got away with it. This is our earliest piece of actual broadcast equipment. It's KTRH, the Rice Hotel in Houston. Okay. Back in the late 20s, early 30s, they had big band ballroom dancing upstairs in the ballroom. Well, this is a microphone, and this is a broadcast unit, and what? they would broadcast those dances live on air. And yeah. this is the equipment that they used to they do that. That's amazing that they could do that. Look how big that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> and you consider that this is, this is called a Marty box. Okay. And the, the talent that would go out to your high school football game would carry this in his microphone up to the press box, plug this in. That was the link to the radio station oh, to do the announcements, okay. color and everything from. And didn't have to depend on a telephone line and that sort of thing. Wow. Uh, the guy that actually, Marty, and his uh, manufacturing and everything was done in uh, Corsicana, Texas. Okay. Oh, and I failed to mention, up on the wall, there was a weatherman, long-time weatherman in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth Market, named Harold Taft. Oh, I remember Harold. Remember? Yeah. That's one of his original maps. Really? Yeah, really? You know, used to, the weatherman not only had to do the weather, he had to do artwork. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're from the Dallas area, you've probably heard of Harold Taft. His yeah, he autographed his weather map. Look, that's pretty cool. That's neat. <laughs> These cameras spent their entire career at Yankee Stadium. Oh, wow. From 1976 to 87. And these two racks of electronics was what took to get them on air. Remember yes, the Indian yeah. had test pattern? Oh, yeah. 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 That's the original artwork. Okay. There are ten shades of gray in the headdress. And that's how many shades of gray black and white TV were broadcast. Okay. And so they put that up and all these different lines and everything, and you can see those are kind of got an arc in them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Well, they would they put that up on the screen, then the engineers could tune their cameras and monitors and everything to where they'd get the optimum picture out of it all. Ah. And how this works was they would etch the, the Indian head on this, and you could get, you know, stations could get other things etched, like your call letters and all that stuff in it. And then it would go 
inside a tube like that. Okay. And that tube would scan the, the uh, plate. That, that tube moves here in this device. Okay. Uh -huh. And this entire device is dedicated to, to putting the test pattern up there. Wow. Uh -huh. All that. And I'm uh, pretty sure this one works. Now we've got that simulated because we don't want to burn this thing down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, pretty amazing that they go to that trouble. Wow. wow. Yeah. That That's a lot of machinery. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, it just shows, as, you know, I mean, we got a little phone now that'll do what? Mm -hmm. And more. Yeah, I see all the tubes. I'm like, at any time something could go wrong, it'd, it'd take you hours to figure out where it was coming from. Yeah. Wow. In 1979, a couple of guys figured out that uh, they could rent satellite time 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the same price as a couple of hours a day. Mm -hmm. And then they had to figure out how to, how to fill it. That's how ESPN was yeah, I, I remember the first few years of ESPN, they had a lot of ping pong and volleyball. They didn't have <laughs> many, any ma real major sports. Their, their first broadcast was actually a 30 minute program about what ESPN was going to be. Really? <laughs> and then they had a, a double header of women's softball. Mm -hmm. Sponsored by Bud Roger. We theorized that if you got enough Bud in you, you could watch the softball. <laughs> <laughs> But they had, they had three of these. This is one of the originals in 1979. All three of these and their two big units were all used for Reagan's first uh, inauguration. Okay. The machine room. Whoa. All the gear that made noise was. Amazing. I don't know how anybody could figure everything out. I'll tell you what, this thing had been converted partially to digital. Uh -huh. We pulled the wire out of this thing, out of the floor, and from behind this rack, you cannot even imagine how much wire we pulled out of this thing, and then, you know, started kind of building it back. If you go down that hall, to the left in the first floor. 24 hours a day, seven ESPN days a week. Oh, this ESPN is the ESPN audio booth. Cable network. Wow. wow. Now, this one has good air conditioning in it. Yeah. Imagine being in here with four or five other people oh. chain smoking. Oh, yeah. oh goodness. Serious? Was, you know, coats and ties and cigarettes. Oh, the hallmark of any good news organization. Oh my gosh. Wow. So you guys ha really had to clean up all the equipment and everything pretty good. Oh huh? yeah, and I mean, it was, <laughs> it was pretty rank in here when it first I came bet. in. This is uh, a Krylon machine. It's what they uh, type all of the crawls at the bottom of the screen. Okay. And oh, all that okay. stuff in with. Wow. And that one is showing signs of life. We've got a, uh, a volunteer that drives up from Dallas probably once a month and tinkers with that thing and other things. Mm -hmm. He's gotten quite a bit of gear in this thing going up in this department. The director would sit here and then the crawlon operator and then you'd have another couple of guys down switching cameras and all that and putting up uh, what the director wanted to see. Fascinating. So it'd be a, parked outside like Yankee Stadium mm -hmm. while the Plug cameramen in. were all down on the fields and mm -hmm. They were doing all that. Yeah, have a you know have a camera for each one of the uh, monitors up there. Right. And cool. The director could pick which shot he wanted and you know back them up and you know the mm -hmm. tape operators and stuff. I suppose you could operate the the videotape from there. Wow. Oh yeah, the little black box is what that would. A little dial on the side. That, that's mm -hmm. what you could shuttle the tape with. Okay. Okay. That's so cool. 1949. They were an early equipment manufacturer, and they also ended up having to have their own network for a while until they could no longer compete with GE and uh, RCA and the what you did. Okay. Yeah. And the networks and all, they, they finally went past, I'm supposing. 
but this is serial number 101. This is the first uh, remote bus that Dumont built. And wow. quite a lot of the stuff in this thing is original to the bus. So this is an original 1949 studio. Yep. Portable studio. And it has a, it has a Kilgore connection as well. Uh, there was an old man named Tom Potter that originally bought this bus in 49 at a cost of about $95,000. Wow. wow. It'd be a chunk of change now. Oh, yeah. Well, he had it, the KBTV in Dallas, and you know you know how old men are. Well, <laughs> when he got to one of those troughs, he sold everything to somebody else. <laughs> Can you <laughs> imagine this driving this? Look at this big steering wow. wheel. Yep, so a rear engine, mm -hmm. rear transmission, stick shift linkage goes all the way to the back. Wow. No power steering. No. Oh, goodness, now, really. Now, when we, uh -uh. It, this used to be parked where the ESPN truck is, and uh -huh. Chuck moved it over here. He uh -huh. just came out of it just soaking wet. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> With all the equipment, this has to be really heavy. Yeah. Well, the engine being in the back helps, but yeah. my gosh. Yeah. And where's the AC? <laughs> yeah, there's not any. That's, That's it. it there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this thing, this thing wouldn't go fast enough to get a good wind blowing through the bet. windows. Oh, my gosh. And the little tiny wipers. Yeah. Oh it, my gosh. I think it had like 14,000 miles on it when Chuck bought it. That's what this bus originally, when he got it, looked like. This all air conditioning that they added on to it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the home unit. And, I mean, it was rough. Oh my goodness. And the people that had it were hoarders. Oh and, no. And, and some of the equipment out of the bus was in their house. He had to go in their house and climb through the mess to find the gear. Oh. But he got as much as he could find, and it's back in the bus.